Professor David Stuckler here. Today, I want to talk to you about a crisis, a crisis that is like a cancer in the heart of science, a crisis that cuts across all fields from medicine to psychology to economics. And this is probably going to be one of the biggest challenges we face as scientists in this generation and generations to come. Because when the public loses confidence in science, this opens the door for politicians to discount the role of these biased experts and pave the way for radical ideologies to rule the roost. So what's really at the core of this crisis? I want to share with you today and I want to leave you with tips about what you can do about it and also to up your game to really be the avant-garde, the new generation of ethical, prudent scientists who, let's face it, we're all doing this because we believe science can make the world a better place. Place. I'm a big advocate for that, and I hope you will join me on my quest to use science to improve the world. So this crisis I'm talking about is a crisis of replicability, first and foremost. So Amgen did a study where they took 53 landmark cancer findings. These are landmark findings that were used to really considered basic innovations, really important points of reference in the field that others drew on, that was used for clinical development, for drugs, for cancer really important studies. They set out to reproduce them following the methods that the authors had published to see if they took those same steps that the authors set out following their guide, would they get the same conclusions? Of these 53 studies, they found that only six could be reproduced independently. That's about 10%. And that is a damning figure. 10% of landmark fundamental cancer findings could not even be reproduced. It's like we're building a sandcastle, a house made of sand that is weak and crumbly on something as important as cancer. When I first found out about this, I couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, this is devastating to the house of science. But then it was found that this isn't just cancer. This cuts across the board. A another professor, a very famous guy, John Ioannidis from Stanford, looked at 432 papers reporting sex differences in lots of different areas of health, lung cancer, hypertension, multiple sclerosis, really important if we think we've got to develop treatments that are different for men and women. And he found only one data set could actually be reproduced and recreated. And this is important because reproducibility is what sets us apart as scientists. It enables you to say, take my methods, check my assumptions, interrogate my data, and you will see that my bias didn't get in there. But you, if you follow my steps, you're going to get the same answers as me. Another paper by Arts and colleagues took a hundred important experiments done in psychology uh, that were published not just in any journal, but three of the highest ranking psychology journals. He found that only one third to one half of those findings could be replicated in their work. And the same has now been done for experimental economics, financial economics, sociology, a range of fields. This is a cancer in science that is across the board. It, because what it means is that most of our published science, most of our published findings are false. Think about that for a second. Most of our research is false. False. So why is this happening? We need to first kind of diagnose what are the root causes of this cancer before we figure out how we can stamp it out. And, you know, reflecting on my career and other scientists, I'd say there are two big things going on. One is there are massive pressures to publish. Publication is like money in the bank. The old cliche, publish or perish. And it's not just published anywhere, it's almost a rite of passage. In economics, you've got to publish in the top five economic journals to land that assistant professor gig at a, a leading institution. And there are a lot of incentives to keep people out. And it, it's very difficult to do with acceptance rates one to 3%. What this means is that a lot of negative findings are hidden. That if you do a study and you don't find an answer you're looking for, it gets buried. And so we have this hidden graveyard of tons and tons of studies that just never made the cut. And so it's like we are a bit blind. It's like we have one eye, not two. We only see the positive. We don't see the negative and we don't have a complete picture of science. I'm going to show you exactly what that means in a second. That's something called publication bias. The other thing that can happen is that researchers, because they know they've got to publish in a high impact journal, they know something that's maybe not statistically significant at conventional thresholds like 0.05, which is a common one that's used, that if they don't publish with significance, uh, that it's not going to get accepted by a journal. So what do they do? They fiddle around with their data. They maybe, if you're doing statistical models, put in some different controls, we tweak some things, we reduce some outliers here and there, sample specific variation until we get something that just crosses the threshold of that 0.05 significance we want to hit. That's called 
P hacking, hacking the probability value of a paper. And people have done scans auditing journals and they find a lot of the P values cluster right around that 0.05 where you know, if this was just kind of randomly occurring, you'd see this smooth continuum and not that clustering around 0.05. Hiding negative findings and P hacking are part of what's going on. The other issue is that it's so easy to get away with. It's very, very hard to detect. One of the only tools we've got that can reveal it is something called a systematic review where we create a funnel plot. And what this funnel plot is showing, it's like a scientific tree. And you can see on one side of this tree, the positive findings, each of these dots is a study. And these are the positive findings and the other side is a negative finding. And somewhere around uh, the truth, uh, there should be kind of a true value and the, the paper should be kind of evenly distributed across both sides. So a healthy tree looks balanced like this one that I've got illustrated here in the panel. An unhealthy tree is like it's been shaved in half, like this one, which only shows positive findings. And these systematic reviews, by pulling out the findings from lots of studies, find that, hey, we're missing half the tree, only the positive studies are getting published. And that's this phenomenon of publication bias reveals there is a big problem here. And this is a big problem because by this publication bias means that say doctors want to know the true effect of a drug, they're not going to see it. Suppose, right, there's a whole half of this tree that centers that says that these clinical interventions had negative impacts. Well, later on, we're going to find this out only when patients start complaining of heart attacks or other health problems because the drug didn't work the way we thought it would, which we would have known if we had had all these negative findings in the first place. Some companies, I'm not saying many do this, but they can just roll the die. And we know from probability one out of 20 times how they set up their study, they're going to get the result that they want to get. And when then you've got financial pressures to publish in the background, you get very perverse incentives and you end up with a situation situation of why most research findings are false. So what can we do about this crisis? What can you do personally at, to raise the bar and solve this crisis of uh, replicability that I believe threatens our own very existence as scientists and our public credibility? Well, there's a few things. One is transparency. Transparency about our methods, transparency about our findings. And instead of just relying on people to do this, there are new programs out there that try to call for pre-registration of studies and developing protocols. So what is that? When you've developed your methods, you're going to effectively handcuff yourself to those methods to say, I'm going to do the study in the way that I a priori from the very beginning set out to do. Any deviation from that protocol, I'm going to publish, be transparent about, and disclose later why that happened. So reviewers and the general public can make up their mind if that was a fair assumption, if that was a reasonable deviation for whatever logistical reason or whatever happened from my protocol. Here's an example on something called Prospero, where these where protocols have become the norm. We still need pharmaceutical companies, for example, and other experimental designs in many fields like economics, also psychology, to pre-register their trials. Unfortunately, this is still voluntary, it's still partial. The gatekeepers of this process are journal editors who increasingly need to say, we will not publish your trial unless there has been pre-registration. The second thing that can be done is accountability. And that is to perform more systematic reviews in fields where possible to test for the health of our scientific tree. And this will hold the entire field accountable because if we continue to see publication bias, that part of the tree missing, then we know that something has gone wrong. And listen, I'm not gonna say that there's easy solutions. There's no silver magic bullet panacea, but these are the two best proposals to achieve transparency and accountability in science. I believe that is the bare minimum. Listen, if you like this video, you're interested in learning more about the crisis of replicability in science. I've got some tools below and I've also got a step-by-step -step guide on doing these systematic reviews that have helped tons of students who have never published before to do their own systematic review and get their first publication. Guys, look forward to seeing you in the next video.